something, doctors are less likely to tell a baby boomer to use a portal than a silent gen person to use a portal. And I dug into that, that well, what's going on with that? And it's because the baby boomers are oftentimes, when they go to the doctor, they're bringing mom and maybe even an adult child, or they're having conversations with a doctor about three different people in their life that they're caring for and trying to help manage. And now if they tried to put something on a portal, it's like which person and how, you know. So it's interesting how doctors are finding right now interfacing with baby boomers because baby boomers are kind of sandwiched in caring for um, aging parents and possibly even uh, kids uh, or grandkids. Uh, so when we talk about the generations and climate, uh, you know, there's some pretty consistent prioritization that uh, climate should be a top priority to ensure a sustainable planet for future generations. 57% of the silent uh, generation and boomers um, feel it should be a top priority, 63% on Gen X, and as you move to younger generations, it's even higher. Um, the Gen X folks were the first to list uh, a natural disaster as Remember those key impacts on our life? You know, what's impacted our life? The first time a natural weather event uh, appeared for any generation was Gen X, and it was the Hurricane Katrina event. And so, and now it's going to become increasingly, you know, more common. But one of the things that I think is important, and you've already, I, I've already participated in, in, in witnessed meetings that you've all had regarding water. Uh, a major part of your master plan update is going to be about water. It involves coordination with the Arizona Department of Water Resources uh, and staying attuned to uh, the conservation programs and the management strategies. We're now in a fifth management period uh, about how we need to stay in compliance to assure the water supply for our population. So you're going to see that have to be a continued part of this discussion uh, on master plans. Governance. Uh, when we look at governance versus the population, these three generations hold 98% of the federally elected and appointed positions. So they're leading. These three generations are the leaders of our country, um, but they make up 49% of the population. So they're speaking for people who can't have voices yet. You know, maybe younger populations, not ready, not qualified. Um, and politically, they're making 95% of the donations. Uh, so it's just something to stay attuned to. When we're talking about governance here at Sun City West, and you're in the process of looking at, at, at boards and electing committees, I encourage you to think about your leadership. And is it, how representative is it of the three or four generations that are actually here? And, um, and try to make sure voices are at the table so that you, you don't have complaining later and you, you have creative outcomes. So in the survey, we asked, what would encourage you to participate more in board or committee meetings? And uh, I want to skip you to that bottom box at the bottom, 56% of the respondents said, I'm happy with my level of participation. But that means that there's a big opportunity because 44% said, I could be encouraged to participate more. That made me really happy. I'm happy to hear that that today, you, you know, I listened in the, to your earlier discussion and you'd like more participation in your forums. Well, 44% are saying you could encourage me to participate more by doing the following things. I need a better understanding of what the board does. Um, I want to know the agenda in advance. Uh, I want to feel welcome or heard. I'd like the meetings to be less contentious. I'd like the board to be caring and easily approachable. Um, I'd like the to know the agenda is authentic and not predetermined. Um, and can you remind me? I have a busy schedule. <laughs> People want to be reminded about the board meetings. You know, they, you've got so much activity here. It's not surprising that, oh, the board meeting, you know, just you missed it. Um, and maybe some hospitality surrounding encouraging people to come in person, you know. Uh, 
skipping to the bottom, the evening board meetings, that 11% of the pie, there's people still working. They have a busy schedule. So when things are done during the day, it's harder for them to uh, engage. So something to think about if you're in charge of some committees or clubs. And then some other things that, that people said, I could be encouraged, but I need a little more time to settle into Sun City West. We heard that. Uh, I need some help with YouTube. Um, and other people said, I just need some time off. I'm a little burned out. Maybe it's from work. Maybe it's from already having served. Uh, what we heard from you and what we learned is that your participation style in a meeting such as this varies by generation. Uh, that the uh, Gen X are going to be more inclined to watch it on YouTube. Maybe they're at work. Maybe they're getting ready for work. Um, and the silent generation is going to be the most likely to show up in person and uh, show their faces. So, uh, and the boomers are kind of you know balancing uh, balancing both. The participation in voting, the silent generation, as a percentage of who they are here. Um, has the highest efficacy of voting. And um, the other thing that matters in terms of voting in a board election is how long you've lived in Sun City West. It seems that the longer you're here, perhaps you feel more qualified or educated to make your vote or you figure out what the systems are and you vote. But um, those, are, those are a couple of the impacts. So we had 25% of the survey respondents said they reached out to the board with questions or concerns, but we didn't have a... Um, Another question that let us know how they, if they got, were satisfied, did they get those questions answered? So we know that they're reaching out. I, I don't have, I'm sorry, any answer on whether or not those questions got addressed. Uh, what would encourage you to run for a board seat? So um, the biggest answer box, 41%, was other. You know, they, so it was a variety of, of reasons. Um, some people can't be encouraged because they're not interested or they're, have, they have a health concern. Um, but for the most part, there was give me more information. Uh, a lot of people said, I want the Torch Academy first. And that's a fantastic um, opportunity. I don't know how excited or possible it is to expand that program and how many more people would go into it. But what a brilliant program to help people uh, know the community and be able to lead and represent. Uh, uh, people have said, you know, they want to live here a little longer before they run. So uh, board professionalism matters. I know in one of the sessions I was at recently, I think Tim brought up talking about a code of conduct. I think that would seemingly um, be appreciated, that, that people want to make sure that it's a, that there's a, 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 and maybe we have to teach them. Maybe we have to teach people Robert's Rules of Orders. We can't assume everybody knows uh, knows those things. Um, so volunteerism, a big part of this community, uh, a big part of how this community has has operated uh, successfully for, for so many years. Sun City West residents volunteer more than your national peers. And that's not surprising. Um, that's one of the, the things, the hallmarks I remember we always talked about at Del Webb and how proud we were of Sun City West residents and, and Del Webb residents in general because of their volunteerism. Uh, the, uh, the silent generation as a population in our country volunteers at a rate of 25%. In Sun City West, you guys volunteer at a rate of 46% nearly twice that of your national peers. It's really fantastic. The baby boomers volunteer currently at a rate of about 31% in the country and 43% here at Sun City West. Gen X is 36% volunteerism in the country and 40% at Sun City West. So um, just interesting to know these are trends, you know, what, you know, and, and what might be driving it. But you can see on the left-hand side the value of U.S. volunteerism to our country and imagine the value of volunteerism to your community. So when you don't want to have dues increases or you want things done or better, think about how you can serve yourself through volunteerism to avoid having to hire people that perhaps right now are difficult to find and expensive to have um, as a means to, uh, to an end. And to that point, 80%, so while 44% of Sun City West residents currently volunteer, 80% volunteer right here. 
So that is a direct impact on your budget and your dues in your community. Uh, historically, I recall there was a posse, the Prides, Sun Health Auxiliary Service Clubs. I'm not sure where all those are at today in your community. Uh, but those are groups that were providing critical services to this community. When we ask people, um, do you volunteer? 44% obviously said yes, that's, that's what I've been referring to. 37% said I don't, but I plan to. Um, or, or I'm sorry, 37% said, said I don't, and I don't plan to. So there's 37% who don't want to participate in a volunteer way here in the community. And they say the reasons they don't is they don't want a long-term commitment. So I don't know, maybe we could find some short-term commitments and they can still be helpful. Uh, there's 32% who say they're too busy and it just doesn't fit my schedule. 22% have no desire. 7% say, I need some help. I need to get started. I need some training. You know, So maybe grab somebody and, and help them get started. 4% uh, don't feel appreciated or welcome. And look, sometimes this is really hard work and we need to be thoughtful and careful with people who are volunteering because I think most of us mean well. And, um, uh, and to not feel appreciated after we're trying is... Um, is difficult. So 19%, that's a really nice number out there that plan to volunteer within a year. So, um, you know, whatever we can do to get them engaged would be great. Sun City West residents, golf participation. So, right, we're a community built on golf. We have hundreds of thousands of rounds here per year. Uh, it was built in a time when golf courses were in major expansion mode. Uh, and I was involved in a lot of that around the country. And uh, now golf courses are nationally in a contraction mode. And the golf courses that are going away tend to be golf courses with lower greens fees, um, lower uh, rounds dues. It's, it's um, you know, those experiences tend to be the ones that are, that are going away and struggling. Golfers did grow in the pandemic by 2%. Um, and uh, another thing that grew uh, not just in the pandemic, but has been anyway, is what we call off-course golf. So there's people starting to get in the game of golf. Women and beginners um, are getting in the game of golf in an off-course way. So it's through driving ranges, uh, places like Top Golf, maybe going to putting greens, doing things that aren't getting them on the course. Um, and so this is an indicator that, that look, they might transition to uh, the golf course eventually, which would, would be great. Um, <clears throat> when we look at golf here, just to show you how golf um, passionate we are, 7% uh, of the population of Silent Gen, less than 7% golfs. 45% of the silent gen in Sun City West, golfs. And when I say golfs, this is they've said in the survey they played golf. They might have not done it every year. They might do it once a year, but uh, and they might be an off-course golfer, but this is the number. At Sun City West, for the boomers, it's 48% have indicated they have played golf. Now, that's not, they're not playing rounds every week. This is not saying that. This is saying they might have gone out and hit a ball at a driving range. Um, and then for Gen X, it's 49%. Uh, but look at Gen X's number in the population, 10% are out there golfing. So there's a good group of golfers coming up, and uh, the golf magazines that I've read have indicated that Gen X is interested in the sport. And uh, it could be good for the game and certainly would be good for Sun City West uh, if they feel welcome here and and, um, and can fit into the community. So... Um, have you golfed Sun City uh, West golf courses? 47% said they had, but we know from member data that 20% probably golf annually. Um, so weekly golf, when you look at the bar charts to the right, is more common among people over 70 than under 70, which is really cool, you know? So uh, our older residents are out there more often. 93% believe that our golf fees are good value. 95% rate the courses as excellent or good condition. And in the competitive set that we talked about earlier of 10 communities, only Sun City has more golf courses than Sun City West. And that's if we don't use the um, private clubs. But either way, I think they're slightly, um, have, have slightly more. So we asked you, do you, partic do you partake in golf-related activities? Um, 
a restaurant and patio, which is the most popular activity that you partake in outside of being um, uh, uh, on golf. So 23% are saying I use the golf restaurant. 21% uh, use the driving range. Equal number are using the putting green, the pro shop. Um, rates up there, taking golf lessons, uh, using a golf simulator. And then we say, well, what could we do to encourage non-golfers to play golf? And offer free lessons and social events were the most, was the number one answer. So help me get into the game. Guys, it's still an expensive sport, right? If I don't know how to, if, if, if I don't own clubs or I don't the, the, the pay for range balls or I uh, have to pay for a round, but I'm scared to get out on the course because, gosh, I might wreck it. And, you know, it's an intimidating, it can be intimidating. And so what can we do? 23% of you said free lessons, some instruction. Um, others said help me cover some of the costs to get started. Uh, Provide some social events with friends. And uh, <clears throat> if their spouse or a friend would encourage them, they'd get out there. Have some loaner equipment. Make it less stressful, less intimidating. Make it a shorter time commitment. And that's, you know, like, what can we do to, and, and there's all kinds of creative things going on, probably here and around the country, to let people just get out and have a light, a golf light experience um, to encourage them into the game in a bigger way. So one of the other national trends that's actually overtaken golf in master plan communities now for several years, uh, a lot of developers don't want to build golf courses, um, the cost, the sustainability of it. Uh, so the number one amenity really nationally in master plan communities is walking trails. And um, uh, here in our community, the way that we asked you the question, 5 to 10% of you said you use the walking track as a most used amenity. That's not a great correlate to the national trend because um, the national trend is more about trails and naturally occurring walking spaces. So, um, But I'm just trying to share with you that what we did hear from you is that walking, walking matters whether it's an indoor track, an outdoor track, your Gen Xs prefer your outdoor track, your silent Gen prefers your indoor track, um, trails uh, inside the focus groups. Can you see, do you need lights? Okay. okay. The, um, the trails number two and three most requested improvement when we were in the focus group discussions would be to enhance the walking experience here with more shade, more benches, some green or colorful areas of landscaping, some trash bags and dog waste receptacles. A lot of you said, I want to use the golf course for walking. And so um, that's a discussion. Uh, that that's a technical discussion that's got to involve a lot of uh, people who understand golf course, golf course maintenance, um, and yet the desire uh, to be out there. So um, this is just what was was high marks on on the survey, uh, and you wanted longer hours for your indoor walking track. So this is just sharing back with you what what you shared with me. Another piece of the master plan uh, that I, I think you're going to want to address is the performing arts. Uh, I heard a lot about live entertainment and having a space for your live entertainment. Uh, Silent Gen is attending two to three events a year. Boomers are attending about three events a year. And Gen X is attending about three, or three events a year. And you're getting about a 50% attendance rate in the country generationally. And here it's probably... Um, uh, at least that or similar. So the uh, performing art space, what I heard from you is that a lot of you were using Beardsley Park as a most used amenity, uh, and you would like an expansion or remodel of these live performance spaces. And the top suggestions that you were asking uh, us to consider or the community consider was an amphitheater or a larger venue uh, for outdoor live entertainment programming. You want to be prioritized as residents for tickets. And I think Casey's already um, taken care of that. I, I think I heard her make an announcement at a recent meeting that, that um, uh, they adjusted things so that now residents have priority. You want improvements to sound system uh, and acoustics. And uh, 
an improved screen and rehearsal spaces. So uh, working between those. Your competitive communities have well-utilized amphitheaters, so there's certainly an argument out there for uh, some kind of an outdoor uh, uh, venue. Uh, talking about your clubs, uh, how will Gen X's independence impact clubs? One of the things that Gen X, we talked about that they're the small business owners, they're the entrepreneurs, um, and Sun City West was a community that was built on belonging. And uh, that was a phrase that we used um, marketing this community, is all the things that you could join. And uh, Silent Gen uh, here, 73% of Silent Gen belong to a club here in Sun City West, uh, and an average of two clubs, similar to Baby Boomers. The Gen X isn't quite in the same belonger category. Now, I don't know if it's just because they're young and they're going to age into it, and or maybe we don't have the clubs that they need, but one of the things that the data did show is they feel the least welcome. So when we're looking at clubs, and, and uh, I would encourage us to think about how can we be more welcoming to one another, uh, particularly if, if we're of a different um, a generation, we may need to step out of our comfort zone a little bit. 28% uh, of our residents, uh, according to the survey, don't belong to a club at all, but otherwise the majority do. Uh, the clubs that create and perform arts were uh, large um, favorites, were big favorites, and uh, looking at arts, dance, and music, and this mirrors the national trend that we're seeing, uh, that nationally 30% of each generation is interested in clubs that create. They're creators and makers. So that's your um, arts, crafts, woodworking, metal, photography, you know, beading, where these, these things were the, the, the crafting and the maker clubs were getting very high marks. And in the focus groups, it was fascinating that when I asked people in the focus groups, would you try something new in 2022? And depending on the group, but it was between 45 and 62% said, yeah, I'll try something new in, in 2022. And those were the things that they were talking about was the creator maker clubs um, as, as heavy, uh, the dance, uh, and I should throw dance and music into that as well. <clears throat> so uh, one of the other uh, pieces, I, I know I'm running out of time here, is the restaurant and uh, shaping the dining experience. If we're looking at generations, I'm sorry, my slides have slipped somehow. The, the titles have all dropped. Um, <clears throat> is if we're crafting an ex a food experience, being sensitive that the silent generation is more traditional in their desires, eating out is special. Uh, and for the baby boomers, they're loyalists, they'll return for good service, they want familiar food, but give me a little creative twist on it, please, and uh, make sure it's clean. Uh, the Gen X group is looking for ambiance, atmosphere, food variety, adventure, so we got a lot of audiences uh, to please, um, and uh, uh, as always, that's a, that's a challenge, but there was uh, certainly in creating a bar for these folks, a, a restaurant bar experiences, make a visible menu with lighting and good font sizes. For singles and widows, can we have a bar that we could dine at versus sitting at a table by ourselves? Um, and can you host some events for business uh, interests and special interests and social groups? <clears throat> so this is a chart that basically shows that there was um, uh, a lot of support for a self-sufficient casual dining experience here in Sun City West. Uh, some people even said you could use some reserves, you could use some dues, um, but generally a tremendous interest in at least having something here uh, that was self-sufficient. They would like the experience to be more on the casual side and have indoor-outdoor seating views, offer drinks and coffee service, <clears throat> occasional live music, uh, examples that were referred to as favorable <clears throat> or comparable uh, would be Anacapa, Trilogies, Restaurant, and Sun City Grand. <clears throat> this is showing the comparison of casual dining to a bar or tavern or a fine dining, and you can see that the, the uh, favorite is casual dining, but support generally around. So 
pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the country. I'm going to have to talk a little faster. Um, the, um, uh, the sport obviously was introduced in 1967, but there's now 5 million players in the country. It's doubled, doubled since 2017 um, as a sport. Uh, there's 38,000 courts in the country, over 9,500 venues. Um, there's 90 venues or more being built every month of pickleball. Um, it costs about $30,000 to build a new court, and I think four courts fit into a tennis court. Um, <clears throat> when we look at core play for pickleball, <clears throat> Uh, the two generations, silent and baby boomers, this is national data, uh, make up 52% of the core play, so it's clearly an over-55 sport, um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, they make up 30% of overall players. Gen X makes up about 13% of core play, um, but again, it's, it's rising everywhere. I did do a chart for you on looking at the number of courts in our competitive set. Uh, you have a lot of courts, uh, but the dearth for everybody seems to be covered courts, shaded courts in our climate, and you don't really see them um, in our competitors, but that doesn't mean that it's not a great direction um, for us to consider. It certainly seemed 66% uh, support covering the pickleball courts. Did I miss something? No, I think you did great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, so adding more courts and, and covering courts, there was a definite uh, support for that. You can see the stacked bar chart on the right um, with the orange bar being the part, 30% saying, well, do it self-sufficiently. Um, uh, and then another 23% saying, oh, you could use reserves. And another 11% saying you could use some dues. So um, Coming to a close here, Sun City West has a master plan. I would just recommend to you these mandatory considerations, no matter what you do and how you move forward, is that I think it's very important that you maintain the affordable value of this community. Um, it's foundational uh, to how this place was built. Uh, the equity and inclusion of three generations and their values should always be considered in anything that you're doing moving forward making sure you're in compliance with the Arizona Department of Water Resources and water management policy for so many reasons. Um, supporting resident engagement in governance and volunteerism. Anything you can do yourselves or your friends to get them engaged, showing up at meetings, volunteering, getting involved makes a big difference here. Um, and then I would encourage you to monitor your resident and not just your resident, but your employee uh, satisfaction. Uh, one of the things I've said to Bill and I think to Sue in my discussion with them is this is a complicated process, master planning is, but it is a lot more challenging to refurbish the Mona Lisa than to paint it blank. And when I was with Del Webb and doing communities over the years with a developer that had a professional team and staff that, that, that did this every day, for their living, um, we were working with blank slates. And that's hard. It's hard as a, to, to do it in development. And now we're trying to do it at Sun City West, create an update without some of that same, same background. So understand this is a difficult process. Be patient with yourselves. Be patient with one another. Be patient with the professionals that are coming to the table because this is an uncharted territory and you're touching something very precious. Um, so I would just leave you with that caution. So that's a review of the seven steps. I'm at 1101. I'm sure people are going to be exiting on me here shortly. I've got two slides left. One is this is the master plan panel that I recommend you consider setting up to help guide and illuminate you through this process. My point about this is that these are not decision makers. My point is that you take torch educated graduates that help your professionals be familiar with the community and have the institutional knowledge of Sun City West without further burdening your board or staff um, and, and have a panel that's basically available to them uh, through the master plan process that this group would be selected to provide objective, non-political insight, maintain confidentiality when necessary with the professionals that they're meeting with um, to help them get to concepts um, that would ultimately be brought to you, uh, contribute diverse perspectives and experience. So the selection of that master plan panel, I think, is important. Um, uh, 
recognizing that that master plan panel does not, and not my intention in recommending this, to replace your resident engagement. There should still be resident engagement of all kinds, but the master plan panel is really there to support and illuminate uh, the professionals that are gonna be working with you that aren't here every day and don't have all the knowledge that you guys have. Uh, and I think that that panel maybe should exist for 12 to 18 months, but you know that that's uh, a thought process. And then the, the second piece is this amenity specific work groups, which I referenced earlier, where I think your residents, employees, and board should work side by side in some specific amenity um, uh, workshops uh, to help get focus on the amenities to guide the professionals and give input and feedback to the professionals that will ultimately help in this kind of whole reallocation or or update of the um, of the final piece. So uh, that is that's the end. That's the end of my show. <laughs> so thank you for your patience and your listening. And I'm three minutes over. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Michelle. That was uh, very, very thorough, and I'm uh, really appreciative of your ability to uh, drill down the survey information and the information from, you know, the um, data from studies across the country, and connecting that with all of the pieces to uh, kind of pull it together. So um, do we have specific questions um, from the board? Tim? Uh, yeah, Michelle, do you know of any other large community like ours that has gone through the reinventing process like we're looking at? Uh, I can't say that I have a precedent off the top of my head. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, that there are older active adult communities, perhaps Florida, you know, that you could look to that are large scale, but I, that Dell Webb has done, uh, other than your neighbor's Sun City, when they've maybe upgraded or done something, I don't think there's a lot of precedent for this. And so I we think would that's, basically be breaking new ground. I think you're breaking new ground. And, okay. and you, have a, you have a, unlike other Dell Webb communities around the country, they're smaller, they're, and that makes a big difference. We have a large population here, and uh, so. Yeah. Sharon? Um, did you, uh, Michelle, thank you very much. This is very helpful. Um, did you look at any of the AARP livable communities? Because I didn't see anything referenced in here. It was one of the questions that I'd ask of Epic Strategies a long time ago, because they have over 600 of them in the United States. And there's built, they're actually building one in Tempe right now. So that's one of the ones that's out there that is in the process of being built that we actually have local that we could go look at and you want Do you know to, the name of it? Shane? I don't, but I can get it for you for okay. sure. Yeah. Um, because the person who's doing all the transit for it works for Northwest Valley Connects, is helping okay. us with transportation. Great. So I can definitely get it for you. Yeah. It's just one of the areas that I get information from all the time, mm -hmm. and I, I know that it's important for people to just look it up. You can actually, mm -hmm. they'll send you out their magazine all the time mm -hmm. that tells you what's going on in livable communities. And mm -hmm. it's one where the Gen Z and the Gen X are mm -hmm. actually moving into because of the way they're being built. So I just right. asked, did you have any? I'm, I'm any familiar problem? with livable communities. Walkable communities is another term that's used inside the master planning domain. Um, they're different community. They usually have very different location parameters mm -hmm. than a Sun City West. You know, okay. this uh, where we're located in an unincorporated area, not part of a municipality. Um, you know, puts us in a different category. So to Tim's question, the precedent, um, we could learn things about from livable communities and walkable communities and incorporate them, but they're not the same, they're not created and governed and existing locationally in the same way that we are. So one, one follow-up question then. <clears throat> so basically when, what you're saying is that, that the livable communities are more into a city. For example, Sun City Grand is, it has the city of surprise. So when City of Surprise is building another, I want to say it's like 243 acres of, of walking space and, mm -hmm. and buildings right now, they're, they're in the drawing stages of it, on that 700 acres that they have in Surprise, that would be what, it's run by the city, so it, they have more control than we do 
here in with the county. It would make sense that that might be the case. Okay. If, if you have a precedent of an unincorporated right. uh, livable city, then that might be one to look at. Um, okay. But yeah, I think it I'll, makes a difference. I'll try yeah. and get you the name of that cool. as well, because I do have somebody that's on our on Northwest mm -hmm. Valley Connects board that is the director of advocacy for AARP. So he Great. has contacts okay. that you could see. Excellent. I'll definitely look. Great, thanks. Jane. Okay, other questions? Uh, Roberta. Well, first I have a statement if the boomers were 1946 to 64, your stats are wrong because we're 76 this year. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and that includes a lot of us on this table. Um, my other question is, is there a timeline for implementation? I haven't seen that. I mean, is this going to go on for years or is it are we going to have a sort of a cutoff date when we know mm -hmm. we can because a lot of things have been delayed over the years like the tennis courts at Kuntz because we keep being told or we're waiting on the master plan mm -hmm. so is there a deadline um, that would be a next step for us to make a decision about other questions Comments, questions from the audience? Come up to the microphone, please. <laughs> name name, and, and number. I just made a little facetious, but a little humor in this situation. My name is Paul Burrier. The right number is uh, yeah, 113848. And I just thought some of the numbers were skewed when you got talking about the uh, age limit of 41 to 56. Seems like a lot of people in here always hear you gotta be 55 to get in here or have somebody in your family 55. And uh, a lot of trophy wives are in here. I think. <laughs> trophy husbands. <laughs> well, I don't know what to say about that, but. <laughs> that's the group that's gonna be here soon. <laughs> Other questions? Anybody? Um, okay, we will take the information and connect with our general manager and determine the next steps that we're going to be take, taking. Um, I do want to announce that we've had uh, technical issues throughout Michelle's presentation. Uh, the internet crashed midway through her presentation, but then it came back up. So the um, AV folks um, will be putting up a recording on YouTube of most of her presentation uh, via a backup recording that they have. Very unfortunate, but thanks for getting some kind of a solution. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, uh, the next thing on the agenda is a reminder um, for committee members to take the online committee application uh, that will be open until May 27th at 2 p.m. Um, we did have two of our committees that did a trial in person in action at the end of their last two uh, their last meeting um, to determine if that's a better way to get feedback from our committee members um, rather than doing the online survey. So um, that's in operation and then we'll get the results of that and make a determination going forward. Okay, uh, are there any general um, board director comments before we close? Anybody online? Sharon? Um, I just wanted to thank, just wanted to thank um, Director Stanenbein and Director Hurley for bringing the electric golf cart question that we had at our last board meeting up at the golf uh, meeting and um, looking at looking at the infrastructure going forward of one of the golf courses, which is Deer Valley, uh, and putting that in, in, into place. The other piece is, is that I believe uh, the general manager stated he was trying to put together some people, anybody interested in looking at that could be a part of that group wanted to, or to Mr. Sandbein. So if there's anybody you looked for volunteerism, there's a question if you're interested in what's looking at the infrastructure for the community, please feel free to give him a call. Um, I think it's really important to understand that I'm not, I'm, when I, we originally asked about the golf carts in general, I'm, I'm not trying to remove 
the gas golf carts. I'm trying to see if there's a way to make sure that our infrastructure that's here is built, that we actually look at all the cart barns and how they have to be, what has to be changed for the golf group in regards to what has to be there, even to add uh, electric golf carts into the situation. And as we're buying new ones to replace the old ones, that we at least take a look at that because going forward, that is going to be something that's going to be in our community. Um, so I think that it's important that we look forward to that piece. And I, I learned a lot from our general manager about not being able to plug in a, um, an amplifier, for example, in regards to the infrastructure at a golf course because we don't have enough electricity. So to me, one of the committees that needs to be looked at in going forward with the master plan is that we actually have an infrastructure group that's looking at all those pieces because it also includes Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and 5G and cell towers and all that. And it is important to our community that we look forward to, to doing those kinds of things. But I wanted to thank them for bringing it up. Thank you. OK. Any other comments? Any comments from the audience? Come up and give your name and number. Two minutes. <laughs> Be very concise. <laughs> We're going to start right now, OK? My name is Linda Rush, and my number is 131584. And I'm speaking today about a medium-sized dog park. I'm advocating for this. I have been living here for four years. And um, when I first moved here, I couldn't understand why you had a big and a small, but no medium-sized dog park. The mo main sized dog that is most popular in the United States is a medium-sized dog park. I started first by meeting with Roberta and having her look it over. That was three years ago. I have talked to Riley and Jack Stroud about this. I have sent in many, many emails, and I'm not speaking just for myself, but anybody who has a medium-sized dog. In the small dog park, if you take a medium-sized dog in there, it's nasty, and they're not happy with you. If you take your medium-sized dog to the big dog park, you get like I did. I got run in by a 150-pound dog and got a bone bruise. So. I don't understand why it couldn't be something that could be done. And I'm not asking for a lot of money to be spent, possibly just a sign on one of the dog parks. But there are a lot of people that don't take their dog there because of that situation. So I would really, really like you to, um, as the property co committee knows I've spoken to them, I'd like you to take a good look at this. Thank you. OK, thank you. Other comment? Again, my name is Peggy Hunter. My number is 65441. Madam President, members of the board, Mr. Schwing, I would like uh, to request that the dog park issue be put on the agenda for a future board meeting. There's a lot of things besides the medium uh, dog situation, the condition, uh, people coming in from Cordobella. Uh, I would really appreciate that if we could discuss this. Thank you. OK, and that might be referred back to properties. Uh, and your other issue probably goes back to the Gulf Committee prior to coming to the board. But that can, that can be handled. Yes, name and number. Paul Burrier, 1138-48. Uh, and along the Dog Park, I know lots of people come here and they have problems, uh, but no solutions. And I thought one of the little solution was the up front with the small dog park to, to, to make for a medium, you could, uh, it's divided into two sections today. And you have a sign there that says uh, any dog 16 inches can come in. I was going to say on the second entrance to the east east side, you could put a sign that said, medium dogs, say 20 inches or under are welcome through this gate. Any dog up to 20. I mean, we're not trying to limit the little dogs. We're just letting the older, medium-sized dogs in there. And that's all I'll say about that. And then I also addressed another committee about our safety flags for the swimming pool at Coombs. And I didn't hear back anything. I know that Bill is probably 
uh, Carl, Carl Wilhelm was going to talk to Mr. Boston. I saw him adjusting the lights there, but he was here. Oh, oh, there he is. Okay. But again, uh, I did mention, I was led to believe that the swim team didn't swim there, so they didn't need the flags. Well, I know the swim team does swim there. I'm going to see a lady from the pool put a chair there on the side of the pool to tell her when to turn when she's doing the backstroke. So I, I think other people, and I talked to a lady one time, she says, that sounds like a good point. And she was going to take it to the swim team to talk about it, but um, maybe that's fallen through there. But I'd just like to mention again, for a safety measure, just to uh, maybe put up some flags. It wouldn't okay. be that expensive. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Bill, do you have any comments? I do not. OK. And directors, we're all good? OK, thank you very much for attending a very long meeting, but very valuable. I will adjourn the meeting. <laughs>